times, faced with a problem, looked for a trick or device to solve it. Today, a mathematician faced with a problem tries to discover its essential nature. He asks, what is there about this problem that makes think I ought to be able to solve it? How is it related to other problems I already know how to solve? He looks for patterns, elements of regularity that the mind can recognize. However, most high school students think of mathematics as only a collection of tricks from which they have to select the right one to get the answer in the back of the book. An objective of high school instruction should be to develop in students an understanding of mathematics as the study of patterns. It is this approach, even more than the introduction of new subject matter, that is the essence of the so-called new mathematics being recommended for high school youth. Thus, as a very simple example, students used to be taught to solve an equation like this one by this trick. Change the sign of the seven and write it on the other side. Now admittedly, one gets exactly the same result if he is taught to add seven to both sides of the equation. But this latter is a procedure based on a pattern a fundamental structural law of mathematics. The notion of transposition is a memorized rule with no justification or understanding built in. This illustration is nothing new. Good teachers have been using this approach for a long time. That is precisely why we have begun with it. Another simple example may be taken from arithmetic. This is the way we were taught to do a simple multiplication like 37 times 24. But here is what we have really been doing. Here is the 148 and here is the 740. The essential pattern written in algebraic symbols is called the distributive law and is one of the basic building blocks of algebraic structure. Indeed, all factoring depends on it, although textbooks usually do not emphasize this fact. Instead, they magnify the difference among the several so-called cases of factoring. For example, one textbook I looked at sets up four types of factoring problems. And another added two more. But there is a pattern here, and it applies to every one of these so-called types. Every one of them is an application of the distributive law. A times B plus C equals AB plus AC. Certainly some of the special results are important enough to be memorized separately, but all should be tied together by the underlying pattern, A times B plus C equals AB plus AC. Everyone knows the distinction between odd and even numbers. Here is the pattern underlying them. Each of these odd numbers is 2 times a natural number minus 1. Fill in the box with any integer, say 7, and an odd number is obtained, in this case, 13. Of course, ordinarily, we use a letter rather than a box to indicate a placeholder or variable. But either way, the placeholder serves to reveal the pattern. There is another kind of pattern, too, one that sums up thousands upon thousands of separate observations in one all-inclusive statement. Such statements as these can all be summed up in the simple pattern A times B equals B times A. We call it the commutative law of multiplication. Patterns exist as part of the very structure of all fields of mathematics. Here are some from algebra. 
When we graph a first degree equation, like x plus 2y equals 10, we get this straight line. You recognize, of course, that this pattern can be extended to cover all equations of the form ax plus by plus c equals 0, in which a and b are not both 0. The graph of every such equation in rectangular coordinates is a straight line. We can discover another pattern when we solve two simultaneous linear equations such as these. In solving them, we find that x equals 11 thirds and y equals 4 thirds. We are struck at once by the fact that both x and y are fractions with denominator 3. Is this chance or a pattern? We can find out only by introducing variables or placeholders and studying a general rather than a specific problem. Now let's solve these equations and see what we get. We'll multiply the first equation by d and the second by b. Then, subtracting, factoring, and dividing, we get a solution for x. By a similar process, we solve for y. Notice that the expression ad minus bc occurs in both denominators. We can go back now to the specific equations that we started with and see that those threes in the denominators were not chance. The expression AD minus BC is a recurring pattern. It turns up whenever two simultaneous linear equations are solved. A pattern is more than a formula, and the regularity that we think we see is not always, or necessarily, a true pattern. In examining what may be a pattern, we must understand the essential nature behind the information we have if we are not to be misled. Let's take the expression n squared plus n plus 41 and experiment with it by substituting numerical values for n. Let us tabulate several instances. We note that all of the resulting numbers are prime. Can it be that this formula always yields a prime number? For every number up to and including 39, we would find that it does. But clearly, for n equal to 40, we get 1681, which is 41 times 41. And for n equals 41, we get 41 times 43. Certainly, 1763 is not a prime number, being 41 times 43. And so, our pattern does not universally yield prime numbers. In fact, we would have been misled completely if after trying it a few times, we had accepted without proof the false assumption that the expression always gave us a prime number. We must be sure that we have a real pattern. In this example, there was not the slightest theoretical basis for supposing that the formula produced prime numbers just a collection of instances without meaning. Patterns are not limited to the field of algebra. Here is a very simple one that the ancient Egyptians put to highly practical use. They found that if they formed a triangle with sides proportional to 3, 4, and 5, they automatically produced a right triangle. By stretching ropes in lengths of 3, 4, and 5 units, they obtained a right triangle, which they used in resurveying their land after the annual inundation of the Nile. Now, let's take that 3, 4, 5 triangle and raise a typical mathematical question.
can we find other sets of three integers that will yield right triangles? Yes, we can. And the pattern will deliver to us as many of them as we may desire. Here is the pattern. Taking any two integers, u and v, with u greater than v, such a set of these numbers is u square plus v square, u square minus v square, and 2uv. These are the integral sides of a right triangle. It is easy to show that this is true by making use of the Pythagorean theorem. First, we'll multiply out the square of u square plus v square. Now, let's add and subtract 2u square v square. Combine and factor. And the result we were seeking has been easily established. Geometrically, the three integers produced by this pattern can always be used as sides of a right triangle, and so can their multiples. Let us tabulate a few. The notion of pattern permeates and interlaces all fields of mathematics. Our illustrations have touched arithmetic, algebra, and geometry. And, as you all know, trigonometry is full of patterns. Here is one of the simplest. And this one is a pattern that ties together several isolated geometric facts. By showing patterns, teachers can simplify their own job and at the same time develop in their students a sense of method, an ability to generalize, a knowledge of relationships among otherwise isolated facts, a feeling of insight and power, a readiness for more advanced work, but most important of all, perhaps, an understanding of the true nature of mathematics.